morning. It's a real privilege to be with you. I really thank Dr. Mark Roberts and Laura Tivis for asking me to be a part of the first annual research symposium that St. Luke's is holding. On the morning that we're shooting this, it's actually six degrees in Boise, so I hope downstream a couple weeks it's warmer for you all. I'm really pleased that they allowed me to do this because actually on the day that you're all meeting, I'll be in warm, sunny San Diego, California. So thank you, Mark, and thank you, Laura, for having the creativity of allowing me to do this. What Dr. Roberts and Laura wanted me to do is help set some sort of context for the morning in terms of the bigger system of healthcare reform that's going on in our community, in our state, and in our nation. So that as you talk about research opportunities today, you can see where in that big picture of the larger change that this fits. Right now, if we're standing still in the healthcare industry, we're going backwards. This is a time to make major change for the good of our communities and the good of the people we serve. As you can see on my opening slide, I've entitled this talk, Our Fractured Healthcare System and the Bold New World of Healthcare Reform. And I mean that. This is a time to be bold, to be creative, to be out of the box for trying to get our system repositioned to serve the needs of our community and our citizens for the next 50 years. I wanted to set for you some degree of context around the sorts of problems we face as a healthcare industry and that our nation struggles with on a daily basis. First of all, we have 50 million uninsured people in the United States. That's about 18 of our state's combined population. It's the size of an average European nation. It creates a healthcare system where we have the haves and the have-nots. The folks that have insurance can get help when they need it. Those who don't live sicker and they die younger. In our, my second bullet point here, you can see that we have the wrong focus on our healthcare system. We're focused much more on disease instead of on health. What we should be focusing on is keeping people from unnecessarily utilizing our healthcare system. It's all about trying to make sure that they're functional and that we don't need all the downstream efforts that are necessary if we have a healthy society in the first place. We have the wrong delivery model in place. We have way too few primary care physicians and way too many subspecialists. And indeed, that's part of what the creation of the system has provided. If you get paid more to do things, then the system will do things. There's been pennies on the dollar paid for prevention and wellness, good chronic disease management. We pay pennies on the dollar to control hypertension and diabetes, mental illness, depression. But we pay tens of thousands of dollars on the back end for amputations, chronic renal dialysis, ICU work, and heart attack and stroke care in intensive care units. So it's a matter of right-sizing the system. It's a matter of getting the balance right. We've got to have the right team on the field because it's all about access. It's all about timely access to good quality care to keep people healthy. We have staggering costs in our healthcare system. In fact, $2.8 trillion worth of healthcare uh, costs per year in our country. That makes healthcare the largest economic uh, sector in the entire American economy. That's about $8,500 per every man, woman, and child in this country. That's more than four times the European average and more than 40% higher than the next closest per capita country, which is Switzerland, which parenthetically has a healthcare system very similar to the United States. This also leads to staggering bankruptcies. In fact, the largest reason for bankruptcy in the United States today is because people can't pay their medical bills. It's a frightening statistic that 1.5 million people go medically bankrupt each year, one every 30 seconds. We've got to right-size this system so that nobody is a second away from a disaster that could find them, their family, and their future generations bankrupt financially. We also have quality healthcare problems in our system. For the fact that we rank first in the world for the amount of expenditures we have in healthcare, we rank 37th in the world in terms of our healthcare outcomes. And that ranks us right behind Costa Rica. 
we also have issues with quality. You would think that all of American medicine is high quality. Well, that's not, not the case. Indeed, what we have is, again, pockets of very good quality care and pockets, especially in the have-not community, where they're not getting timely care or no care at all. And so we have major health care disparities amongst groups of people or uh, areas of our country, rural versus urban, different ethnic groups or socioeconomic groups compared to others. And so we have, when you average that all together, quality problems. We have no quality strategy in the United States, and we do need to focus on metrics that will get us a higher quality system. And lastly, we have problems with our health care insurance, primarily around both annual and lifetime caps on how much can be spent, on pre-existing conditions, and that's exactly what the Affordable Care Act tried to bring under control. In the next slide here, what you see is a series of pictures of fires. Because what I've come to recognize that our healthcare system in the United States most resembles is a massive fire department, where we're focused on putting out fires. We've got massive fire trucks, beautiful firehouses, strong burly firemen with large fire hoses. We can put out a flame at 500 yards. But the problem is, is that we need to be preventing the fires in the first place. This is how much we spend on health care annually in the United States, $2.8 trillion. That is a lot of money. And in fact, that's more zeros that I'll ever see on any paycheck that I'll ever have. This shows the growth of health care spending in the United States. On the far left, you see that in 1960, we were spending about $27 billion a year in this country for health care. That is rapidly escalated. In 2012, that now is at about $2.8 trillion. And as you can see here by 2020, that becomes $4.6 trillion. This next slide shows what happens to the gross domestic product. In 1935, when FDR was president of the United States, the spending gross domestic product was 3.8% of our annual spend. In 2009, that's about 16% of the gross domestic product of the entire United States. It's about 18% today. In 2013, it grows to 25% in 2025 and a staggering 50% in 2082. That means that one out of every $2 spent in the United States, 2082, projected to be on health care. That's why we've got a major problem today to try to get under control. And in fact, in the United States today, 10,000 people will turn age 65. And indeed, every day for the next 30 years, 10,000 more people will turn age 65. We have a tsunami of people, I resemble this remark because I'm a baby boomer, that are becoming Medicare-aged people. Medicare will, is projected to become insolvent in the year 2023, and that's why this became a big issue both in the presidential elections of 2008, but also this year in 2012. I wanted to share with you what happens to people over the course of their health care in an average month. This is important, I think, for the audience to understand because it puts in context, again, why it is and how we need to start to restructure our health care system. If you take a thousand people in any community, and this, by the way, was studied in 1961 and produced and reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, and again, the study was redone in 2001 by Larry Green, also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you take a thousand people, and just you can almost think of yourself in this category, in a course of a month, a thousand people, 800 of those folks, or about 80 percent, will have some sort of symptoms. How have you been in the last month? 327 will consider seeking medical care. 217 of those folks will visit a physician's office. 65 will go see a complementary or alternative medicine provider. 21 will actually go to a hospital-based outpatient clinic. 14 will receive some sort of home health care. 13 will visit an emergency department. Eight will be hospitalized. And one, that far small loan box, bottom right, will actually go to a hospital or be in an academic medical center. Now I ask you, where do you think the majority of $2.8 trillion per year is spent? You'd be right. 
if you think it's really in the bottom three boxes. That is where 91 to 93 percent of the entire 2.8 trillion dollars is spent. Now let me ask you another question. Where do you think the majority of medical education and nursing education happens in this country? You'd also be right if you said in those same bottom three boxes. What we've done in this country is we've created a massive firehouse. We have perpetuated a system in which the training and the expense is centered in academic teaching hospitals, large teaching hospitals, emergency rooms, and all the vestiges that are responsible for doing a lot of procedures and a lot of imaging. Now that's been fine in terms of trying to help a lot of problems once they've occurred. The biggest issue is take a look at these boxes and take a look into this upper left hand corner of these series of boxes. I submit to you, that's where health is. That's where primary care lives. We need to shift our focus of attention from the bottom right boxes to the upper left boxes. We need to stop facing inward towards hospitals and emergency rooms and operating rooms and start to face outward towards the community, towards keeping people healthy, keeping people away, from necessarily utilizing all the higher cost downstream care. We'll always need places where folks can go. We just need a lot less of it because everybody will be kept in a healthier condition. Think of yourselves. Who of you wants to go and wait in my waiting room, in my clinic, or in any other doctor's office if you don't need to be? How many of you want to find yourself in an emergency room? How many of you want to end up in an operating room or in the hospital. None of us. I know personally I want to be kept functional. I want to be kept healthy and I want to work in a way in which I'm responsible for keeping myself that way. And I want a healthcare system, quite frankly, that's working with me as a partner to help me stay that way. That, I think, is one of our challenges today, is how can we together as a caring community start to make differences in keeping our communities, our state, our nation healthier. Now, I've come to recognize this metaphor that speaks to how the payment system works around healthcare. If you will, we've got the five greatest basketball players on the planet. These people are truly superstars. But here's the way our payment system works. We give them each a basketball, we tell them to dribble around at random and shoot at will. And so just imagine these five greatest players, they're f shooting up shots. You get just in your mind's eye the arcs of all these balls. Some of them falling short of the basket, some in clanking off the iron, some going through, some just hitting the backboard. But the way our payment system works is we say, every time you take a shot, we'll pay you. Doesn't matter if it goes in or not, it's just we'll pay you for every time you take a shot. And then we play a team like Spain or Portugal or France or Canada or Britain or Australia or New Zealand or Japan and we get beat. Why do you think the United States with the five best players on the planet gets beat? The reason is that we don't pass the ball. We don't integrate. We don't coordinate. We don't work as a team. We've created a system in which there's minimal communication because communication, passing of information, is not what gets paid for in our system. Doing things to people gets paid for in our system. Operations, imaging, procedures. We've got to change the focus, and this is one of the challenges to you all today, is to start to work together as a community better as a team. How do we pass the ball better? How do we make sure communication is being handled in a way that maximizes the outcome? And the outcome is good health for the people we're treating. I've also come to recognize, because I grew up loving to play pinball, and what I recognized is that our system is like a massive pinball machine. We can have sick people in the system bouncing off of bumpers, accruing greater costs, greater scores on the pinball machine, and we have no control of the ball. Again, what primary care does 
and what all of our challenges are to help us get to a better healthcare system is start to integrate and coordinate how the ball is handled in a way that maximizes individual health. So, here we go. March 23rd, 2010, President Obama signs into law the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The biggest change in health care since 1965 when Lyndon Johnson signed into law Medicare and Medicaid. Now at that time in 1965, we had a lot of similar problems. A lot of pe people living sick, dying young, they couldn't afford health care. We were seeing a lot of poor and a lot of the elderly folks absolutely bankrupt their families because they got sick. The society came together and acted at that time to correct this problem. I can tell you, Medicare when it first came in was much hated by both the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, the insurance industry, etc. because it was felt to overstep its bounds in controlling health care. But what happened in the country because of Medicare's passage was that the people loved it. It started to help those groups of people that were most at risk, the elderly and the poor. Skip forward now, 47 years, we face similar problems. A lot of have and have nots in our society, 50 million people that can't afford health insurance and don't have it. We have to start to get to a point where we start to make sure that we have good health care for everyone, no one's left out, and that we start to redirect health care costs back into keeping them healthy. One thing that Medicare did that was a major problem is it started to set up payment schemes that valued more procedures and imaging than it did chronic disease management or keeping people healthy. There was nothing, really pennies on the dollar, for prevention. Everything was directed towards the back end of the healthcare system, which was reactive medicine, the fires, if you will. Medicare propped up the fire departments, if you will. What the Affordable Care Act is trying to do is shift that curve again back to the front end of the healthcare system where prevention, healthcare promotion, chronic disease management, timely access starts to bring down healthcare costs. And so in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, depending on how you look at it, were six major areas that started to correct our healthcare system. We wanted to, number one, expand coverage. Number two, start to help make sure that we had the right workforce team on the field. We had to have many more primary care physicians. In fact, when you get outside the United States and you take a look at workforce balance, it's about 50-50 between primary care physicians and subspecialists. In our country right now, as I talk with you, that balance is 70% subspecialists, 30% primary care physicians. And the staggering fact is that 90% of the young men and women graduating from medical school in the last 10 years are choosing to go into subspecialties. So at a time when we need the right team on the field, more primary care physicians to provide more timely access to care, we've got the wrong team there. And so that's part of why this act and law was rolled out over eight years. The expansion piece starts between 2014 and 2016. That gave, from the time of passage in 2010, several years to start to write the workforce. So we had places for people to go. It would be like me giving everybody in Boise free bus passes, but we only have two buses to put them on. We had to amplify the front end of the system to make sure that we had enough workforce so that people could go to places. Now, if Idaho pushes forward with Medicaid expansion and all of a sudden 150,000 new people are brought into the system, I can almost guarantee you we're going to have problems initially for the first couple years in terms of access. We don't have enough primary care physicians in this state. In fact, we're about 33 percent below where we need to be. We rank tied for last in the United States for having the right number of primary care physicians. And so what we're going to see is an overutilization of the emergency rooms too many hospitalizations initially as people start to deal with pent-up demand, but with time, we'll start to get that right. One of the challenges for all of you today is to work together, 
collaboratively as a team of stakeholders from the business community, from the healthcare industry, from research and universities to really start to right size how we go about providing health care. Another big issue was working on cost reform. You've heard me say we're already spending $2.8 trillion a year on health care. And what we have to do with this is start to bring that down. There is no question about that. It is bankrupting our nation as a whole. And in fact, there's nothing that's a greater threat to our nation, not a nuclear Iran, not just the meltdown of the financial industries. The biggest threat to our country long term is what's happening with the cost of health care. That's why this is a big issue. It's why it became a large presidential issue in 2008 and then again in 2012. What the Affordable Care Act cost was about $938 billion spread over 10 years. But if you do the math on that, that's about $94 billion a year divided into $2.8 trillion a year. It's a 3.4% cost to try to right-size the system. The good news is that it started to bend that cost curve. And in fact, $128 billion was projected to be uh, saved in the first decade of the law followed by $1 trillion saved in the next decade of the law. So as opposed to unbridled GDP growth, we start to bend that cost curve. That's why this became an issue. It's why there was so much pushback. There were 2.8 trillion reasons not to change it for folks that had it good. But as a whole, and I ask you, when we take a look at the nation as a whole, is it the right thing not to correct our health care system? To not make sure that everybody is afforded quality care in a timely way to help maximize their productivity, the workforce of our nation and our state, and to make sure that everybody's living healthier and achieving their maximum potential. The other thing that it did, a big part, was to help with health insurance reform. And many of you know that it stopped annual and lifetime caps. It stopped discriminating against those with pre-existing conditions. All of a sudden, it allows everybody in, no one out, so that you can start to direct people to the front end of the healthcare system where they can get timely access and we can maximize health. That became a big deal. The other thing is it puts in place a quality strategy. We have no quality strategy in this country. The Affordable Care Act started to put that in place. And the same with wellness and prevention. No prevention strategy in the United States. If it's about keeping people healthy, keeping them functional, then we must do a better job with wellness and prevention. The other thing it did, back to the second bullet point, is it started to put a strategy in place around workforce. Heretofore, there is no strategy in the United States on the types and numbers of physicians or nurses, physical therapists, dentists, where they're located in our country. And so if we're going to make sure that every place is afforded timely accessible health care in a meaningful fashion to the citizens of those communities, we must start as a nation thinking about this larger strategic plan of how do we go about this. We have to stop the free-for-all of health care so that the haves get and the have-nots don't. And that's part of the challenge to all of you today as community stakeholders is to help pull that thought together. Here is just a diagram that I constructed to show the existing health care system, the six pillars of reform leading to an accountable, high-performing, performing, accessible, and affordable health care system. Really, if there's one word that I'd like you to think of in terms of what it is that we need to do to reform the system, it's to integrate it. It's to pass the ball. It's to make sure that all the pieces are working together for the common good of making sure that wellness and prevention and patients' health is maximized. If we use the patient as the North Star of our compass, then we'll start to make the right decisions in terms of how best to make the changes necessary. And that integration can happen in the office by the usage of an electronic medical record that starts to bring pieces of data together to integrate it for the providers so that they understand what's going on within the practice better. The patient-centered medical home, which is a concept of how a practice engages all the people impaneled to the practice to start to maximize their health and to treat them in a timely accessible way to make sure that their hypertension, their diabetes, their depression are best controlled. 
for the hospital to start to work in a co coordinated and integrated way, to make sure that all the parts of the system in the community are working together to maximize people's health. And lastly, this concept of the accountable care organization, which is a group of entities all working together collaboratively around integration and coordination of care. So this concept of the patient-centered medical home is what happens at a practice level. In my day job, I'm the director of the Family Medicine Residency Program and the CEO of our community health center. All four of our clinics are patient-centered medical homes. We have disease registries. We know how many patients have hypertension, diabetes, depression, mental illness. We start to coordinate their care. We start to outreach to them to keep them healthy. Success in our future is having people not necessarily need to see us because they're living healthier. In fact, it's a failure on our part of outpatient treatment if we have people with heart failure that are needing to be hospitalized or depression that's out of control that's led to a suicide or a suicide attempt, of having diabetes out of control that leads to a hospitalization or an ER trip because we didn't, in a timely way, care for them. So what we're training all our residents right now in Boise, Idaho, is how to utilize the patient-centered medical home to outreach to patients in a proactive way, not wait for them to come to us, but us to go to them, to educate them, to keep them healthy. That's the concept of the patient-centered medical home. So when St. Luke's has its healthcare system of primary care providers, it's looking to make that happen for the best of the patients that the community serves. The data to date has been excellent on patient-centered medical homes. There's been an excellent return on investment. The Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania, Group Health Cooperative in Seattle, MultiCare in, in Minneapolis, Dean Health System in Wisconsin, the Community Care of North Carolina Project in North Carolina, Intermountain Healthcare in Utah have all showed that the quality of care and patient experiences, care coordination and patient access all improve with the patient-centered medical home model. There's a decrease in ER utilization of anywhere from 15 to 50 percent, averages about 30 percent, decreased hospitalization by 10 to 40 percent, roughly an average of about 19 percent, and decreased cost in patient care, roughly about $835 per year. The last bullet I think also is important, and that is that it increases patient satisfaction and decreases physician burnout. What I've seen in the primary care providers, when I was the president of the American Academy of Family Physicians and went around the entire country meeting with the 105,000 members that we have in our academy, were a lot of disheartened, demoralized primary care physicians. This is a way in which we start to absolutely re-engage them in the type of care that they were trained to provide. Here's just a simple diagram of what I'm trying to get across. The patient-centered medical home starts to integrate the members of a practice into that practice to maximize health. The accountable care organization starts to maximize the integration and coordination of multiple patient-centered medical homes and multiple other uh, agencies within the community to work collaboratively and collectively towards health care promotion and keeping people uh, healthy through coordination and integration of activities. If you will, the patient-centered medical home at the center with the medical home neighborhood of different organizations, all that are important, working with it, from hospice to home health care, to group visitation, to mental health, to oral and dental health entities, to, to psychology, to all sorts of entities, working collaboratively as a home, trying to help make sure that patients' health is maximized. Similarly, with the accountable care organization concept, of which St. Luke's is a healthcare system, could certainly be like an accountable care organization, if not exactly an accountable care organization, is one in which, again, the system itself starts to integrate and coordinate healthcare. If you will, I like this example of the symphony. If we're starting to work together as a team better, it's just like this symphony. It's about integration and coordination. But what it takes also is at the center of the system, a thinking conductor. Somebody in charge, a board, an individual, a group, a team, 
that starts to bring the other players online. Can you just imagine in your, in your mind this symphony playing its beautiful music? We've listened to it many times. We know how wonderful it can be. But can you also imagine this same symphony if they're not playing together, if they're not on the same sheet of music? Can you only imagine in your mind's eye the cacophony of sound that it can produce? What I'm talking about now is getting our system to work together. I contend to you that America has the resource, America has the innovation, the intelligence, and the creativity to do this. The question I think before us all is do we have the will to be able to pull this off? So here we are, 2013 now. We've just gone through presidential election. The Affordable Care Act has survived a Supreme Court vote five to four. It survived the 2012 presidential election, but here we sit as a country. There's still rancor in Congress. Can we start to act together within Congress? Is there an enhanced willingness to work together? I tend to be an optimist. I think we will get there. I think we'll do a better job with this. I hope so, because we can't afford not to do this. And we can't delay it and just keep kicking the can down the road as we start to rack up higher costs. Implementation of the Affordable Care Act because of the 2012 presidential election is almost a surety now. And so the question becomes, how do we start to pull ourselves together to act as a team to help things happen? Let me just historically remind you of what happened with Medicare's passage in 1965. For about five years, it was despised, a lot of pushback. Again, the players uh, involved mostly the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, groups of physicians not happy. As I mentioned a little earlier, the American public loved it. And what started to happen was the acceptance of Medicare started to make changes and outcomes that were salutary towards people. And I think we'll see the same thing happen with the Affordable Care Act, meaning that five-year period from 2010 to 2015, we start to see the benefits of the change in the law start to kick in. We start to think collaboratively and collectively of how do we make it work, not how do we stop it, how do we repeal and replace, but rather how do we refine and refocus. I just wanted to share with you that depending on your party, this is not a political issue. I want to really make the point that this is about good policy for the American public. And that even if between the Democrats and Republicans or independents, there were political issues, which it became definitely an ideologic issue, that 80% of all of this is truly agreed upon. Nobody's disputing the fact that we want a lower cost system. Nobody is disputing the fact that we want to improve quality of health care in our country. Nobody is disputing that we have access problems. Better prevention and wellness is something that both parties are clearly behind, as well as the patient-centered medical home and the concept of the accountable care organizations. It's around integration and coordination. And I think the bottom line there is that we can't afford not to. Remember when I showed the pie graphs of the increasing amount of gross domestic product being consumed by our healthcare system, that becomes untenable. Almost like strapping a 50 pound rock to you and asking you to swim across Lucky Peak Reservoir. I don't care how good of a swimmer you are, if I'm gonna put 50 pounds in the center of your back and ask you to swim across that, you might get 10 or 15, 20, 30 yards out, but you're going down. And the same with our country's healthcare system until we get this under control. So, what to expect nationally? Well, first, the Affordable Care Act is here to stay. I don't foresee, clearly, in the next four years, any repeal and replacement. In fact, it's now how do we make this work that's cost-effective and beneficial. Integration and coordination of care will be incredibly important. Cost reduction, going to be a mantra. It's about quality of care, not quantity of care. We've got to refocus on making the baskets, not just shooting the shots. 
We need more focus on health and less on health care. Now, let me say that point one more time. More of a focus on health and less on health care. This is about keeping people healthy, not needing the downstream services. If we're successful with this, we will see a decreased utilization of ERs and of hospitals. We'll actually see hospital sizes decrease. Not that those services they provide aren't important, they will be, and there'll always be people that will need them, but not as a default to a failed primary care system. And we'll need a greater focus on primary care. If you don't have access in a timely way that's high quality, then you can't have any of the downstream benefits occur. Healthcare reform in Idaho, a topic unto itself. The ACA implementation will continue to be debated here, but will continue to progressively move forward because it's the law of the land. Medicaid managed care will start to roll out, first for behavioral health care and then for primary care. Health insurance exchange will be greatly debated by the legislature this year. It's the right thing to do to make sure that Idaho stays in control of its health insurance exchange. I don't think Idaho should default to letting the federal government do it. Let's step up to the plate and be responsible as a group of citizens for making that happen for our state. Medicaid expansion and redesign. I clearly sat on the governor's uh, Medicaid expansion work group. We voted 15 to nothing in terms of Medicaid expansion. It's no question that it's a benefit to Idaho. But I must agree with the governor also that Medicaid needs to be redesigned. I hope that we can do this in a way that we do not lose any of the federal money coming towards us, however. I'd like to see it done this year so that we redesign Medicaid, we move forward getting 100% of the federal matching dollars to then expand coverage to those folks and help start to apply the principles that I've been talking to you about to Idaho citizens. Lastly, state and region co-ops will start to become a more talked about entity in terms of how do we bring together insurance companies along with providers, hospitals, different groups and organizations to start to maximize both the payment for care but the delivery of care. St. Luke's has moved into this arena and I applaud them for that. And the other thing is that there will be a consolidation in the healthcare industry. There will start to be ways in which these teams start to form and come together and that is an important moment, I think, in our healthcare industry as we start to streamline and organize care. So, almost done. I want to finish up with a couple thoughts. What can we do together? Well, first, I think focus on the communities and the public's health. Again, it's about health, not about disease. It's about keeping people away from utilizing all the downstream uh, facilities and resources. Not that those shouldn't be used when needed, but let's not have it be a default to not keeping people healthy in the first place. Second, let's create synergy amongst all of us as community partners. We have an opportunity. We're all in this together. Let's think creatively across silos and work together. Third, let's be bold and creative and innovative. And in fact, I applaud Dr. Roberts for having this research symposium because what we're talking about here is a series of research opportunities, pilots to study how best to do the sorts of things I've said. I've put into a big container a lot of the what is wrong with the system and what needs to be fixed. How we do it becomes, I think, all of our opportunities to take a look at research pilot activities and how together we can partner to make that happen. Let's experiment and pilot different models of health care, prevention, wellness, chronic disease management, and end-of-life care. You may not know, but 40 percent of all the spending in a human being's lifetime comes in the last two years of their life. Why don't we work collaboratively in ways to make sure we know exactly what people do or don't want? Not everything needs to be done. I know when my time comes, I want to be dry. I want to be warm. I want to be in my house. I want to be surrounded by people who love me. I do not want to be in an ICU, half clothed, with 
tubes out of every orifice of my body, beepers and buzzer, buzzers going off. That is not how I want to spend the last several days of my life. Why not get together as a community, do a better job around end of life care, and let's help indeed get people the type of care that they truly want and dial down a lot of the unnecessary waste and cost in the last two years of people's lives. Let's also take a look at communicating openly about opportunities to improve access, improve quality, lower cost, and meet the community need. So to this end, I wrote a book. It's called Fractured, America's Broken Healthcare System and What We Must Do to Heal It, to try to help bring these opportunities and these problems to the forefront. I think it's a way in which we collaboratively can start to tackle the issues and take a look at the challenges, but also the opportunities that lie within. I'd like to end with this quote from Winston Churchill, who in the dark days of World War II, when Nazi Germany was relentlessly bombing London, said to the people, never, never, never give up. And I'd like to leave with all of us that attitude of never giving up for doing what's right for the American public, for trying to get our healthcare system back on track, to utilize the resources that we have in an incredibly gifted country to start to get this right for the American public. With that, I thank you. I thank Mark Roberts for inviting me here today. I wish you a wonderful conference, a wonderful research symposium, in which you try to frame these issues in ways that we have actionable steps that will help us together move forward. Thank you very much.